Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Hot Slice. I'm creative director Josh Count. Along with me, Mr. Editor-in-Chief, Jeremy White. How you doing, Jeremy? Josh, man. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well on this really drab so, January morning. It's another winter day in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, but it won't be long before we're in Las Vegas in the warm yeah. sunshine. Those those days are getting a little bit longer, but yeah. Um, and uh, and speaking of Las Vegas, uh, we have uh, on the show today our keynote speaker for Pizza Expo 2021, Mr. Anthony Falco. You know, Anthony's a great guy. He's a he's a buddy of mine. I love hanging out with him. We tapped him for the Pizza and Pasta Northeast show a couple of years ago. He did um, a seminar on how to use sourdough in your pizzeria that was really as entertaining as it was informative. Um, he's got a new cookbook coming out in May that he's excited to talk about. It's called Pizza Czar Recipes and Know How from a World Traveling Pizza Chef. You know, Anthony. Um, kind of bounced around as a young man with uh we'll say without direction he'll admit that he didn't really know what he wanted to do in life stumbled into the restaurant scene eventually stumbled into the pizza world and was smitten with pizza as we all are um made a name for himself at a very high profile pizzeria in brooklyn uh, some things went south there we won't get a whole lot into that not our business i don't really care what happened there but <laughs> i'm sure he'll touch on it a little bit and then from there he ended up consulting around the world he he literally he calls himself a you know a international pizza consultant, international pizza and consultant. it's a great name and it's it's totally legit because he's all around the world it's what he does you know he may be in bali one week and then you'll look on his instagram i love to follow his instagram it's just very entertaining yeah and you'll see a couple weeks later he may be in sao paulo and then you may find him in toronto and then oh, I wonder where Anthony's at now. And he's in the, uh, you know, United Arab Emirates or something. He literally globe trots helping people all across this shrinking world of ours open pizzerias and what a cool job. What, at the end and of also what a creative mind. I mean, he, he does everything from, you know, he can do social media, uh, you know, illustration, uh, t-shirt. He has some of the best t-shirts I've ever seen, uh, pizza t-shirts I've ever seen. So he's yeah, he kind of does, creative. does a little bit of everything. Um, and he definitely found his calling, especially, uh, he did. you know, consulting he did. with pizzerias. You know, Anthony has a lot of haters out there and, and, and he'll admit that there are a lot of people who question, um, for whatever reason, they'll say, well, he doesn't have the credentials that that others have. He, he didn't, you know, go to wherever, Milan, um, Sicily. At the end of the park, day, he makes whatever. amazing pizza. Right. And train under a master <laughs> pizza chef or whatever. He makes amazing pizza and he'll tell you, he'll tell you himself. I, I realize I'm not the most credentialed pizza chef out there, but I've made my share of mistakes and I figured it out. I mean, he, he owns that. He's not out parading himself as some, um, pizza god uh now he does he is called the pizza czar which is kind of <laughs> which he gets a kick out of that that he did not give himself that nickname and uh he, he actually jokes about that nickname so it's kind of funny that he named his book that because he's really kind of laughing <laughs> laughing at his haters with that little bit <laughs> so yeah uh i i had a great time talking to anthony and yeah. and uh, i think you're really gonna enjoy this enjoy this podcast and i also we also hope you're enjoying Pizza Expo 365. It is fully launched. So, you know, get out there, um, get on the Pizza Expo 365, uh, register. It's all free. So just go in there and look at the, look at our exhibitors, look at all of our 50 hours of free content. We, we're going to have free content. Uh, we're adding that content uh, at the very middle of February, like every yeah, month. Yeah, here in just a couple content. of weeks, we're going to add, we already have enough content on the platform to keep you busy for a very long time. <laughs> right. But for those of you who, you know, pulled a Netflix weekend binge watch on pizza expo 365, shout out to you guys for that, by the way, for those of you who did that in just a few short weeks, a lot more fresh content is being pushed onto the platform. So there's always going to be something there for you. So, all right, well, uh, let's just roll into this uh, podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the hot slice. That would be, we, we appreciate that very much. And leave a, and leave a review, please. Yes. Tell us how great we are. Yes, please. <laughs> we'll <laughs> read it. If they're, you know, if they're really good, we'll, t we'll read them on the air. So, hey, all hey, right. If you have nothing nice to say, just don't say anything like your grandmother taught you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Thanks guys. And uh, here's Anthony Falco. 
If you're looking for a POS provider that truly understands pizzerias, look no further than PDQ. Designed from the ground up for the exact needs of pizzerias, PDQ POS has been doing pizza ordering, delivery, and takeout for over 32 years. With all the functionality you need in today's environment, including online ordering, rewards, seamless integration, contactless functionality, and so much more, PDQ is your single source for, well, everything. Learn more today at pdqpos.com or call 877-968-6430. That's 877-968-6430. Performance Food Service is proud to deliver high quality products, innovative technology, and custom operational solutions to restaurants of all sizes across the country. The flagship division of Performance Food Group with deep roots in the restaurant industry, Performance Food Service has been the exclusive distributor of the Roma family of brands for more than 65 years. This signature relationship has allowed Performance Food service to become a leader in the pizza and Italian segment of food service nationwide. But well, yeah, huge day for you. You announced uh, your new book on Instagram. Tell us a little bit. First of all, I must say that cover is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> the cover is awesome. I'm like, I got super jealous when I saw it. I was like, damn, I'd really mm-hmm. like a pizza day cover look like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The book is titled Pizza Czar, Recipes and Know-How from a World Traveling Pizza Chef. Yep. That's it. Yeah, it's been three years in the making. I'm, you know, I'm very, I very feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to make this book. Um, you know, Abrams really, you know, they believed in me um, to be able to do this book. And it, it kind of an untraditional, you know, pers- cookbook author. Like, I don't own a restaurant. You know, I have. Um, I'm a pizza consultant, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I don't know if that's, it's, we're in uncharted territory there. So, you know, um, I feel very fortunate to, to have this opportunity to do this book and it's been three years in the making, um, with lots of talented people. I mean, all my clients, you know, I mean, a lot of these recipes, you know, are inspired by the, the work that I did in all these different countries with my clients. Um, you know, and then there's a lot of personal recipes in there as well. There's a lot of stories about, um, you know, growing up in, in Texas, um, and just in like a Sicilian American farming community that, you know, is kind of an unknown kind of story of the Italian American experience. Um, so like there's a, you know, a recipe in there for Faccia di Vecchia, which was like kind of the first pizza that you know I had as a kid Mm -hmm. Um, even though they never called it pizza when they were growing up you know it's just like one of these things that got absorbed into pizza culture Um, and then yeah I mean there's the design is is pretty killer yeah there was uh, uh, he sang is the designer and she absolutely crushed it you know and and I have a long history as a graphic designer and an illustrator so there's a bunch of my illustrations in there um, you know, I was pretty active in the selection of typography and, and, you know, graphic design. We worked, we worked together on it. It was a really great collaborative. So effort. yeah. So creatively all through, even, even to the illustrations kind of you too. That's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a dream to be able to have like, you know, my drawings and my illustration, uh, like, you know, published. So yeah. it's, it's really amazing. Um, you know, I mean, I never imagined when I was young that my life would be around pizza or that people would call me the pizza czar, which I think is a re- totally ridiculous <laughs> title. Which It's a very cool title, though. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess it, I go into detail in the book about how that came to be and, you know, the, the kind of conflict in that. But um, yeah, it's very great. So it's an auspicious day to be doing this podcast. I'm happy to be here to talk with you guys. <laughs> well, so the book you- comes out May 18th. And yeah. it's available now for pre-order. Where can someone purchase this book if they'd like to? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's available for pre-sale right now at every major uh, bookshop. So I definitely encourage, of course, you can go to Amazon. It's there. Um, but I definitely encourage people to, uh, you know, seek out independent booksellers. Um, you know, one of the links that I have up there is bookshop.org. Um, which is, uh, you know, the guy who owns it has a kid in, in my school here in Williamsburg. Um, and it, what they do is, you know, they basically link you up with individual independent bookstores and they, mm-hmm. they, cool. they help independent bookstores survive. You know, I'm from Austin, Texas, original, originally, and there's a place there called Book People, which um, if you've ever heard the term keep Austin weird, 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's because that was a camp that came out of a campaign to to save book people because oh, Barnes wow. and Noble tried to <laughs> open up next to the largest independent historical bookshop. Wow. I didn't know that. Austin. Yeah, <laughs> I did not know so, that. I've seen the bumper stickers all around Austin on my visits there, but I never <laughs> knew where that originated. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's called Book People, and that you know, it's a family friend of mine uh, is uh, the the CEO, and you know, I've been going there my whole life. I saw uh, Timothy Leary speak at a virtual nice. like speaking event there when I was like <laughs> sixteen. Um, very cool. We- I mean, it's weird. They keep it weird there (laughs) that's awesome um and then also for people who are international there's a there's a company called bookdepository.org and they do free international shipping so um, oh wow free international that's pretty cool i have no idea how that's a business i don't know how that works (laughs) (laughs) we won't even Uh, worry about the logistics of that yeah yeah. you grew up in austin texas and now you're in brooklyn uh williamsburg i guess yeah um what exactly started you off. You now travel the world. You consult with pizzerias worldwide, Brazil, United Arab Emirates, wherever. You'll, you'll, you'll go wherever a pizza needs to be made, uh, right? right? So how did you go down the path from um, you know, a Texan to now living in Brooklyn and consulting with pizzerias across the world? It was not a straight line. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I left, I left Austin pretty early on when I was like 18, I got out of there and I was kind of just, just, um, you know, I was like hitchhiking and like sleep crowd surfing and just really no plan. I was going to go to college, but you know, we just didn't have the money. Um, you know, my dad wasn't around, my mom was working, you know, a couple jobs and she had put herself through college and, you know, she was in debt and it just like, you know, I just didn't, it, it was, it, college was just, it wasn't in the cards for me. And so, you know, at some point I was hanging out with some friends in Seattle and, and we started an internet company. Um, and I started actually making really good money at the age of 19 doing web design. Hmm. And um, after a couple of years of that, you know, I just decided it just wasn't for me. Um, and you know, one of the main things that kind of triggered, you know, the, the change in career was, um, my, like kind of a little bit of a family tragedy. Like my, my nephew who had his birthday was one day apart from me. Um, yeah, he died in a car accident and he was Mm -hmm. uh, right before he turned five years old. And, you know, at that, his father had been murdered like a year before that. And so, you know, he had, he was shot to death at, you know, in, in Texas in an incident. And it was just, you know, I mean, it was like kind of a moment where you look yeah. around you and just go, what is the point of anything? You know, yeah. like, yeah. and I, you know, I mean, I had been in the tech industry. The idea was to like, you know, start a dot com and sell it and get rich. And then like, I feel like a lot of people in that world, in the startup world, it's like, I'm going to start this and I'm going to make a bunch of money and then I'm going to real live my real life, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to like follow my passion. Then I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to travel. I'm going to do all this stuff. And like, but that's almost like a drug or are you just going for the next, next dot com and the next sale and the next sale. And then before you know it, it's like 20 years. <laughs> yeah. And your life is every day that you are alive, you know, and yeah. um, that really confronting, you know, kind of that, like losing, you know, a whole kind of part of my family. Um, you know, I just was like, what, am, what is, what's the point of all this? And I just, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I was doing this, you know, with the idea of being able to help my nephew, right? you know, to put him, to help put him through college so he could do something, you know, he could follow his dreams. And then I just, you know, I had like an epiphany where I was just like, I just need to just, I just need to follow my dreams. I don't, I don't know what my dreams are. So I kind of, I had saved a little money and I decided to take off and, um, I started traveling around the world and um, I like based myself out of Amsterdam and um, you know, I uh, traveled around Europe. I traveled to Indonesia. I traveled to Thailand, um, you know, and I was, I was 22 years old and I just was just 
trying to find myself out there, you know, and either find myself or kill myself. So it was, <laughs> it was going to be, it was a toss up. Yeah. And, um, you know, the thing that I realized is before I was in the dot com industry and when I was in high school and when I first moved to Seattle, like I was, you know, like I worked as a dishwasher. I worked as, you know, I worked at the register at a, like a, like a, te- what we call ice house in Texas where they just have like, bar food and beer and mm-hmm. stuff like that and I just thought about all those places and that I was happy working there I loved working in restaurants like the people that you meet in restaurants are people who are not conflicted about what their passions are for the most right. part for the most part you find people that are you know actors musicians artists uh, writers poets and they they know very well that look this is just what I'm going to do to <laughs> make some money today and then I'm going to go home, you know? And if I need to take, you know, like if you're a bartender and you have a job that comes up, you have somebody cover your shift. It's like not a big deal, you know? Right. Um, And people are there pursuing their real life passions. And I wanted to surround myself with those people. Hmm. So I start, I decided at the age of 22 that I was going to dedicate my life to, um, the hospitality business and I had no idea where that was going to take me but I knew that was it like and I have I've worked in the service industry uh since then and mm. I've been a bartender I've been a, a bouncer at a nightclub I've been a dishwasher prep cook uh I I uh, I eventually I started a very small restaurant I was a part owner of a bar in Seattle and then I started a small restaurant inside of a nightclub and it was uh, Belgian fries. <laughs> so where did people come into the equation from there? <laughs> yeah, it's like out of left field. So like when I was in Amsterdam, like the one th- I loved these, I don't know if you've been there, but they have, you know, all through Belgium and the Netherlands, they have these little Belgian fry shops and they're like yeah. tiny little holes in the wall and they serve fries that, out of paper cones mm-hmm. and they have tons of different like, uh, sauces and stuff. Yeah. Perfect bar food. <laughs> yeah. Perfect bar food. So I was like, this concept works at a bar. Seattle is basically very much similar climate to like Amsterdam. You mm-hmm. kind of wet mm-hmm. and overcast and you're ready to just drink some coffee and eat some French fries with mayonnaise. You don't care about anything. <laughs> um, and so I started this little restaurant and I did, I made French fries for three years and, oh, wow. um, we used, local Washington state potatoes just from the other side of the, the, the Cascade mountains. Um, I made 26 different kinds of sauces. Um, wow. <laughs> and I would just prep French peel potatoes and I would make sauces all day. And, and then around the corner towards the last year that I was there around the corner, this person opened a pizzeria and it was called Via Tribunale. And it was mm-hmm. one of the first, yeah. Yeah, we've been Paulton. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this was that really kind of first wave of, you know, Neapolitan pizza, you know, and they had a beautiful wood fired oven. Uh, Dino yeah. Santo Nicolo was the, the, uh, the chef from Naples. And I ate there and I watched him build the place. And I was just like, why the f- am I making French fries? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is like, you know, I'm an Italian American. Like I'm not Belgian. I'm not Dutch. Like, <laughs> you know, pizza has always been my favorite food. Like, you know, I, sh- like, I, I kind of had, I rethought my life a little bit. And then um, also my wife, you know, she's from Seattle. I, she was at the time, she was my girlfriend. And we just were like, you know, I mean, I've just been like, I mean, when you have a small restaurant, like sometimes it feels like uh you know like a ball and chain you know because yeah. mm-hmm. there's not enough revenue to hire someone y- you know you just you would be losing money there's just enough money for you to pull it out pull out yeah. to as if you're pinching every penny every napkin you know every plastic cup if you're doing that then there's enough money for you to survive but you can't leave it if you close the shop you don't eat you know right. so like I just we were like this is I got it I don't know if this is like what I want to do and um you know we let the the nightclub take it over and we just sold all our stuff and 
like I sold my condo that I had, you know, bought with my dot com money and I just we just moved to New York City. <laughs> and that was 2007. And um the first job I got was a, as a bartender because I mean a bartender is a great I I'm a I'm a pretty decent bartender and um you know, if you're a bartender, you can just, you can start making cash immediately. Right. And I had a friend from Seattle and he was working at a place called the the Royal Oak. And it was in Williamsburg back when like, there wasn't in, there wasn't a lot yeah. of like fancy luxury condos and stuff like it was like rubble everywhere. And uh, it was this wild bar where people just did whatever they wanted to do in there. I don't remember people getting carded. I mean, it was like, it was wild. It <laughs> it's was a wild like, west. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was out there. And um, I, uh, I started bartending there and then I met a couple guys who were bartending there and they were like, we're opening a pizzeria in Bushwick and it's going to be called Roberta's. Wow. And that was where, that was my first pizza job. And I started there in uh, the, the winter of 2008 so you started as soon as they opened that, right? You were yeah, I was there the, like the first couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, Roberta's uh, blew up and was very well received, and you ended up getting a lot of notoriety out of that. Yeah, and it's it's you know it's definitely very complicated because I mean there was a lot of great people, um, you know, at Roberta's, and there's a lot of people that deserve a lot of credit, you know, for for making that pizza what it what it is, and sure. you know the press you know, the narrative is they're always trying to find a very simple kind of like, this is the one person who does right. it all. Yeah. Right. And it, and it, I, I became the face of the pizza there towards the end. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started there in 2008, you know, I worked, started part-time. I eventually became like the, the pizza kitchen manager. You know, I really, I worked a lot on the pizza, you know, to try to make it, you know, as good as it could be it evolved a lot in that first year and then I kind of went like part-time you know and I was I mean you know I, I worked at Roberta's for like eight years and 10 months and but it was not always full-time you know it was a part-time mm -hmm. the turning point really was like in 2010 where I bought a mobile pizza oven and I started doing like the pop-up stuff and that really to me was where I learned everything because you know it's one thing when you are making pizza in a kitchen and um someone maybe you've trained someone to make the dough and someone else is making the dough and you're just there making pizza and it's you're in the same environment and the deliveries are coming and sure you know where i really learned a lot was like okay how do you make recreate this pizza in austin texas or in tennessee you know or like Toronto, like with different ingredients and like, you know, started when I started doing these pop-ups and stuff, it really, it was a huge education for me, you know, and like we would be the same crew of people making all of the dough, stretching all of the mozzarella and then doing all of the service, you know, so it was like really full spectrum, you know, and you, like, I think that's where like, um, I mean, I really respect people like, you know, Anthony Mangieri, who like his whole career, like made all his dough and mm. made all his pizzas and like <laughs> really did the whole art, you know, and I think like, I would do that in small bat like events, but with like huge volume, you know, yeah. like making like a thousand pizzas a day, but like making all the dough and then cooking all of the pizzas with a small mm. crew. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it it did. It definitely blew up. You know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. There was a lot of great people. It was just Bushwick, you know, in the right time, right place too. I mean that, right. You know, yeah, when Brooklyn exactly. started exploding. So yeah, exactly. So, you know, and then in 2016, um, you know, I mean, it was, it's a very complicated situation there, but I'll just very shortly, you know, I, I got fired in 2016. Um, well, I was in Los Angeles at the time. Um, you know, it was just like, it was long story short, it was politics. And um, I uh, just started this, I, I got, I did an interview, I did a job interview in Silicon Valley for some people that wanted to make pizza with robots. And, uh, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't going to happen for me. I don't know. Right. I had 
I don't think I'm a very good employee. First of all, I've been fired from every job I've ever had. Like, um, I'm a terrible employee. Um, I have a problem with saying exactly what I think. <laughs> and that's not always valued by certain people who are employing you. Right. Um, Fair enough. As a consultant, I think it's great. I think I'm in, I'm, I, people get me in, you know, they, they, they want brutal honesty. They you know? need the brutal honesty because it's their livelihood at stake. If they're going to be successful, you've got to find their shortcomings and expose them or else they're not going to make it. And they know that. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, whatever, like the narrative says about like, Oh, Anthony Falco put Roberta's on the map. I, first of all, I never said that the, the people who wrote that wrote that. So I don't, you know, if that's what they saw, like, yeah, I was doing all kinds of, like I start like the, we're doing block parties and go into, you know, South by Southwest. I was out there doing a lot of stuff, but there was a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. Sure. Um, Nine years is a good run, at a, you know, as an employee. So I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. think it was a long time. I mean, in the last four years, I mean, I was, it was like every day. I mean, it was like, there would be times where I would work 30 days in a row, like, like nothing, you know, um, many times I would work. 30 days in a row, like, you know, 14 hour days. Like, I mean, it was, yeah. it was like creating the frozen pizza. There would be times when I would get to work at 9 PM and work till 7 AM and then go back to a normal schedule after that. It was, you know, there was all kinds of, it was like my job there was basically just do whatever needed to be done. That know? only leads to burnout though. I mean, that's, that's, that's still only one, you know, yeah, no, I almost, I almost had a nervous breakdown at one point. I had something involving frozen pizza. I don't know what it was, but um, <laughs> I learned a lot and I made a lot of mistakes. And I think that's what I do when I, as a consultant, is I basically share my mistakes. You know, like, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't think I'm the best pizza maker in the world. I don't think I'm the fastest. Uh, I definitely am the least uh, credentialed. Um, <laughs> And I never trained any, under any masters in Italy or anything like that. So, you know, what I, what am I, what are my skill is just mistakes. You know, I've had to try so many different things and different, you know, God, there's so much stuff that happens and 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 like, it's a really just, I have a, like I've developed a flexible mind, you know, very limber mm -hmm. uh, brain cells to be able to kind of confront a situation and, and, be like well i'm not used to anything there's not like one thing that i'm feel safe doing like for instance wood like i've done a lot of wood fired pizza that's probably the most pizza i've made is wood fired pizza mm -hmm. and um uh the wood makes a big difference you know like i was in buenos aires and uh <laughs> we were getting ready to open this place. It's called uh, Atentamente. It's Ate Pizza in Buenos Aires. Incredible. My client, Angelus, is just an amazing woman. And um, she had a vision. And like, I helped her achieve her dream. You know, I mean, it was just one of these case scenarios of why this is the best job ever is I get to go to a place like Buenos Aires. She has this amazing vision. She built a beautiful restaurant and like we worked on designing the kitchen and I got down there and I had 10 days to train the entire staff and wow. get the place ready to open. And, and is that also developing a recipe as well? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And all my recipes are unique to each client because I'm never using the same ingredients twice. So we used right. local, you know, uh, wheat from Argentina. Um, you know, one of the large, we all, I'm always trying to leverage whatever the local ingredients are. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of the, Argentina's one of the largest wheat producers in the world and they have some cool small mills. So that is developing recipes. So I have, when I land, there's all the stuff is like, like we've been doing the research to like, you know, well, I don't need to try that. We'll try this. I want, I want flour that doesn't have chemicals in it. I want flour that's like, you know, not bleached. I want to have, I, I have like, you know, kind of criteria and then we fit those ingredients in there and then we start playing around. So, you know, we go down there and we're making dough and everything. And I'm like, okay, now I'm going to show you guys how to build a wood, an oven in this wood fired oven. And I stack all this wood and I start to light it. 
and I'm trying to light it and like I'm like I got the lighter on there and I got paper in there and it's just and like after about 45 minutes like I look turn around and they're still just kind of staring at me like are you <laughs> so where's show? this fire yeah where's this fire gonna uh, happen uh-oh. and I was just like uh-oh. uh this isn't working like what is what is this wood it was like <laughs> it's called quebracho and it was like very very dense and it oh, doesn't God. flame ever it just <laughs> like charcoals turns into mm-hmm. like charcoal which if you're grilling a steak on a parija there you go <laughs> fantastico it's, it's the wood for you but if you want to start a wood fire and, and so like that was we had to go into problem solving mode mm-hmm you know, immediately. And uh, I just, after about a day of running around and research, we figured out that there's another wood called Quebracho Blanco. And Quebracho Blanco flames up really nice and is mm-hmm. great for pizza ovens, you know. But you just can't count on having the same thing everywhere you are in the world and have it work out, you know. So it's just, it's all about having like a flexible mindset. Yeah, problem solving. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. So, so, you know, when you go to consult um, with these pizzerias, are are most of them brand new, like the one you were just talking about, or are they, or are some, you know, been up for a while and they just need some problem solving? Yeah, um, the Mike, I'm pretty specific in that, like my, I'm I'm doing uh, projects, new projects, like new projects. Okay, gotcha. Occasionally, I'll go in to do some behind the scenes work for existing pizzerias, but. You know, my work, and I, I'm lucky to, to stay busy uh, doing this, is, is helping people start new concepts from scratch. So, you know, people on my Instagram will see me come into a place and make pizza there, you know, and, and then promote that place after it's opened and, and um, you know, kind of show that progress. But what, what they don't see is the usually anywhere from, you know, three months to two years where I'm working with that person, you know, pouring over architectural drawings, developing cut sheets for equipment, you know, figuring out if there's a problem with power or ventilation, you know, doing all of that stuff. Then we start, you know, developing the menu. You, you got to have a menu that matches up with your kitchen. You know, if you, you got to decide, you got to make those decisions early on. Like, is is it just pizza? You know, or our appetizers are going to be a big part of your menu. You know, where are you located? Are you going to be, are you in an office core area of town? Is it going to be lunch customers, you know, and then how are you going to achieve speed and, you know, like quick turnover? Or is it more going to be a neighborhood restaurant where it's going to be weekends and, you know, special occasions? And so, you know, are you going to have more, uh, other entrees are you gonna have a bar you know I mean all these things and luckily you know I I was able to surround myself with really talented people at Roberta's for so long when I was there that I knew I met great wine people you know and you know great chefs that could you know cook other food and you know you always kind of absorb some of that you know and um, so I, I have a little enough of uh, knowledge of kind of all of these things that I've, I was, I'm able to kind of, you know, help them develop a comprehensive plan. And then, um, and then I help them open and I go on site and we do the opening. And then after that, it's like troubleshooting, you know, and, and also yeah. I can help with branding and social media and like, you know, I've done a little bit of all that stuff, you know, in my career. So it's, it's really, I've been very lucky to fall into a career that is, you know, matches my personality and my, you know, kind of history. And, and so going, a couple of years ahead, ago, Jim. oh, go ahead, Jeff. A couple of years ago, you did a an address at in in Atlantic City at mm-hmm. the Pizza and Pasta Northeast show, and specifically, you talked about sourdough and how you utilize sourdough um, as you travel the world and you consult with these pizzerias and you help them develop their recipes and get off the ground. Do you? utilize sourdough in any of their formulas or is that something that's kind of a passion of yours that you do here in the states but you feel like maybe won't work in indonesia or somewhere else yeah um no actually indonesia is the only place in my uh, entire uh, consulting career that i didn't include sourdough all of my clients are either hybrids or all naturally leavened mm-hmm. and and the the pizza we made in indonesia was amazing you know and um you know, I'm, 
I'm, I'm happy to do the full spectrum. You know, I just, it comes down to, you know, I'm very fluid. It's like I present things and my clients taste them and they decide, you know, and I think I've found that, you know, everyone can kind of get in, get like the idea that there's a depth of flavor with that sourdough. And then also the way that it makes you feel after you eat it. So, you know, I mostly do it cause I think it's fun. You know, I think it's just, it's cool to like keep it this is. living thing, you know, and like, um, and it's like the, it's historically, this is the way that bread was made for like 10,000 years. You know, yeah. I just think yeah. that's, and you don't have to buy it, you know, like it's, you know, it doesn't come from a factory, you know, it's like, you just create it and then you keep it. Yeah. And, um, so I love that. And I try to make my, you know, I try to make it not sour through a bunch of different, you know, techniques. And I go over that in the cookbook. There's a lot of like discussion of sourdough and all of the recipes in like are, you can either use a sourdough or a commercial pre-ferment to swap it out, mm -hmm. you know? And so they're all geared to include sourdough, you know, or like a commercial pre-ferment, like a biga or poolish mm -hmm. or sponge, whatever you want to call it. So I think those techniques are very important for adding, you know, flavor because you can get pretty far on just sauce and cheese, you know, yeah, you can. I mean, <laughs> and, <laughs> but I also want my dough on its own. I want you to be able to pull the crust off of that and smell it and taste it and be like, wow, this is just delicious on its own, you know? We're all about the sourdough, aren't we, Josh? Yes, we are. <laughs> oh, right uh, on. Yeah, we're about out of time. Do you have any uh, parting shots, any last-minute questions for Anthony before we let him go plot well, his next, his next you know, adventure? We look forward to uh, you, uh, you know, and Pizza Expo, Keynote yes. Pizza Expo. Yes. So, you know, of course, we you were supposed to be doing that last year. A little pandemic happened. So uh, we're going to bring you back this year. We're going to do it, do it all over again. Run it back. I'm <laughs> I've got a lot of stories to tell uh, more since then. Yeah, I was, that was a pandemic. That was a bummer that March. I was on my way to Australia for the very first time to make pizza. And then I was going to fly from Australia straight to Las Vegas. <sighs> and, and then it all just... Um, and it just went, but, stayed on the couch. <laughs> yeah, but it's been, it's been pretty interesting. You know, I mean, I did uh, my client in Mongolia. We did all of the consulting via Zoom. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you know i'm just an old dog learning new tricks like yeah. everyone else yeah. and yeah. uh you know yeah i definitely look forward to sharing all those with is when is the the pizza expo gonna be it is june 22nd through 24th yeah that's we perfect timing yeah and, and you're gonna... also working on a um for our pizza expo 365 platform you're working on something right now for that um yeah, uh, New York, the article. New York, New York article, right? Yep. So I'm going to be talking about my interpretation of New York style pizza. It's become one of the most requested styles uh, for, for consulting. Um, I think also during the pandemic, it's shown that it's great for delivery, for takeout. You know, it's, it's like, it, it's really a great model. And I think it's, you know, there's more interest now in New York style Um with especially with the pizza master ovens which are revolutionary you know and even the gas ovens so um yeah I'm, I'm excited to share that with you guys um and uh yeah i mean it's you know it's just my my take on it and i think uh it's it's my it's it's my favorite pizza to eat for real sure absolutely yeah. <laughs> anthony man we appreciate your time as always we cannot wait to see you in las vegas in june and until then, happy adventures, and we'll talk again soon. Best All right, luck. guys. Thanks for having me, and I'll talk soon. And, you know, Millennium Fal uh, underscore Falco, there's a link there to, to pre-sale the, to buy the yep. book, and I appreciate everyone checking that out, and uh, we'll be in touch. I'll talk to you guys soon. Absolutely. Good. good luck Thanks, with Anthony. the book. Thanks, Anthony. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. See ya. Take care.